Okay, our speaker tonight is a man I've wanted to meet for a long time. I keep hearing about Brian Heavenhead um, and his enthusiasm for all things prairie, including rattlesnakes snakes and, and uh, plants. Um, so um, I, I got a little pronunciation lesson from him when I first came in here and uh, watching him screw it up. Um, I'm going to read what he wrote for us. Uh, Ron Heavenhead, Akayo, is a well-known naturalist in southern Alberta, equally recognized for his Blackfoot traditional knowledge approach to ecological studies and for his role as the lead conservator for prairie rattlesnakes in the city of Lethbridge. Heavy Head holds a Blackfoot em eminent scholar kind eye doctorship, doctorate sorry, from Red Crow College and the Blood Tribe a master's degree in cultural anthropology from the University of Lethbridge, and principal transfer rights in the Nitsitampi discipline of beaver bundle caretaking. He was formerly the director of Kainai Studies at Red Crow Community College and is currently envisioning the development of a private school without walls. The all right, I give. Come on in, six. Thank you. <laughs> um, this institute, which will offer learning opportunity for all ages, anchored in the Blackfoot knowledge paradigm. And Ryan tonight is going to talk to us about how the Blackfoot people, uh, we often think that they depend on bison, but look, before the advent of horses and rifles, maybe bison weren't such a huge part of their diet. Um, so he's going to talk to, uh, to us tonight about um, the role of plants, native plants, in their lives. So welcome to Brian. Okay. Get to connect some at the Hochboa and Stoanoka Gaiuka. It's up in Wisconsin, Ryan Heavy Head. And um, that's a good introduction of all of my background. A lot of people in Lethbridge know me as the rattlesnake guy. I took over from Reg when he had to move to Edmonton. So I know I know run the uh, rattlesnake mitigation program for the city. But I'm doing a lot of things. <laughs> uh, including right now I'm doing some work with the Galt Museum designing the new Blackfoot portion of the exhibit that's going to be in Fort Wopa now that the Galt is taking over Fort Wopa. And that's going to include a plant foods component to it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that I want to say tonight, and I know I've got under an hour to say things, so <laughs> and, um, and I've got almost 80 slides, so we're going to be moving at as fast a pace as I can, and even at that, I cut out a lot of what I would, what I would like to say. So I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of a return to lack of traditional foods that I've been working on with students, originally at Red Crow College, and now just kind of privately. Yeah, yeah, we can turn off the lights. It'll look, the slides will look better. Um, one of the things uh, that was mentioned in my introduction is that I'm uh, a caretaker of the beaver bundle. The beaver bundle is called Xisk Stocky Mopistan, and that's something that my wife and I are partnered in with Blackfoot Medicine Bundles. It's always a couple that takes care of it together. And uh, the beaver bundle is the embodiment of the original treaty between human beings and animals in Blackfoot territory. Um, and it, that treaty uh, kind of sets out the relationship between humans and animals. One in which, in the Blackfoot paradigm, human beings are considered the newest species, um, or were at least at one point, the newest species to this area. Now, of course, we're getting other species introduced. Um, but humans were the newest at the time of the beaver bundle origin, and there was a, an agreement laid out whereby the human, human beings would learn from the animals um, adaptations, ways to live here that were appropriate to this eco-community. And in turn, for um, that teaching, human beings would have respect for the animals and not um, just consider them enemies, or be afraid of them, or kill them for no reason, only for, for food purposes. So, um, in Blackfoot tradition, we're always trying to learn more from the animals. That part of, part of maintaining that tree is continuing that learning effort. And so this was the Blackfoot project for thousands of years. The origin of the beaver bundle goes back to the domestication of the dog. So it's a long time ago that this started. 
And that carried on up, you know, up until the time that things started shifting. Uh, some of those trade items that were mentioned, the horse, um, rifles, uh, you know, iron kettles and these kind of things start coming in and culture started changing rapidly. Uh, before those technologies were coming in, um, there's a whole history of what Blackfoot hunting practices were like and the development of those hunting practices uh, in the traditional knowledge system. And we know that before, before uh, horses and the, and the trade pots and these kind of things, there was a whole, there was a pottery system here, right? So people were probably staying in one place a lot more, or at least leaving caches, and um, and I think probably had a much more diverse diet than what was encountered at the turn of the century, or not uh, yet, yeah, the turn of the century when contact was happening, and people kind of assumed that that is how Blackfoot people lived all along, basically on a lot of bison, um, with with a, a, a little bit of um, um, moths, a little bit of roots, uh, and a, a lot of Saskatoon and choke cherries. I think there was a lot more to it than that. So I've been exploring this. Um, Blackfoot territory, just so everybody's aware of it, is defined by the waters. Every, every place uh, in North America, all the indigenous places, indigenous political areas are defined by the waters. So um, Blackfoot territory is the upper Missouri and upper Saskatchewan drainage basin. So this is this is a what the first Blackfoot map drawn on paper. Um, it was copied by Peter Fiddler of the Hudson's Bay Company uh, from an image that uh, an informant among the Begunny drew for him. And they drew it on the ground and he, he copied it. But basically, uh, what was trying to be expressed is Blackfoot territory is a lodge, okay? and the rivers are the lodge poles. Right? And then, so the middle line going up off of that strip that is the mountains is the Missouri River and all the, all the tributaries uh, going into it. There's a second lodge to the north, of course, which is the, the, the upper Saskatchewan system. Both of them meet um, here on this end at Lower St. Mary's Lake in Montana, where I was just at today, actually. Um, that Lower St. Mary's Lake feeds the Milk River and the St. Mary's River. Right? So that's the meeting point. And that meeting point was where the origin of the beaver bundle treaty with the animals occurred. So I'm just giving you some background so, so you can understand where I'm coming from uh, with my learning with the plants and the animals. Um, the first challenge that my wife and I had with the beaver bundle, uh, one of the first challenges was to try to learn how to reintroduce um, waterfowl eggs uh, into the ceremonies. They had been gone for Blackfoot ceremonies for a while. Everybody had gone to chicken eggs. Right? You always still got eggs at the ceremonies, but nobody had, knew how to get them from the source anymore. So our elder challenged us to get them from the source again, and um, we, we started working on that. And our first year, we failed. And we failed because um, we weren't really ecologically, like, cued in to, what, to the, everything that was going on out there. Uh, we thought it would be an easy thing where we looked at the Blackfoot lunar system, which is also part of the a beaver bundle. It's a, it's a lunar time system, a lunar calendar. And one of those moons is called Sa'akis, so the duck moon. And so we thought all that would be required of us is we go out on the duck moon and start looking for eggs. That must be when you look for eggs in the duck moon. So we went out and looked, and we found a goose who was sitting on a nest, sure enough. And uh, so I waded out in the water to the island where she was on, she moved off, and I took took a couple of her eggs, not all of them, and we brought them home. And we quickly learned that if a goose is sitting on a nest, it's probably too late to be taking her eggs, even if it's a few days. You know, an incubation of a goose egg is 28 days, and a lot of development goes on pretty quick. Maybe by past standards, <laughs> a little ways into that period would have been all right, but by today's standards. You know, that's like playing fear factor. We don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so um, we failed in our egg mission the first year that we had the bundle. But this, the second year, uh, we started going out um, a whole lunar cycle before, and we were going to the wetlands here um, in Lethbridge, the Elizabeth Hall wetlands, 
And we were spending a couple of hours every evening watching the birds and watching you know, everything that was going on, the animals, watching the plants, uh, watching the beavers engage with the plants, watching um, the, the birds that were migrating in and what they were doing, certainly watching the geese, which is our main mission, was to try to figure out, geese are the ones that lay the eggs first. Eh? And so we were, we were trying to figure out when they were caching their eggs. And um, by sitting and watching every night for a month, <laughs> We, we figured it out, right? We were right on, right on spot that year. We knew when they were hiding their eggs by the way that their behaviors changed, and we, you know, we saw the whole thing uh, unfold. And so uh, then we went out and we collected just a couple of eggs that year. We didn't take a whole lot. Our elder told us, you know, just as long as we put a couple into the ceremony, that's putting them back, okay? So we don't need to reduce goose populations. <laughs> um, by taking a lot of eggs, although although uh, these days we have a um, we have a, a, an arrangement with the city uh, because out on Henderson Lake, that nice island that was once labeled with a big sign as a goose kind of <laughs> reserve where they could do their thing, um, the golf course at Henderson got a permit from the government to go and dip those eggs in oil every year so that none of them develop. And so when we heard about this, uh, we talked to the federal government, we talked to uh, Fish and Wildlife, and we talked to the city, and we talked to the golf course, and we made an arrangement and said, well, before they go and dip those eggs, we want to go and take, take them and we can use them for ceremony. And uh, so we leave just a couple of eggs in each nest so that the mothers won't you know, re-nest um, and they dip those eggs. And I still think it's, it's unfortunate, but at least we're making the best of a bad situation. Anyway, that second year we did succeed, and um, what we what we learned was that the uh, the day that we were able to get our first Bible egg happened to be Easter. <laughs> and as the years have gone on since, we found that sure enough, every year um, at the new moon after the equinox, which is really the Easter time. Um, the, the, of course, the church has it the first Sunday after the full moon after the equinox, but really that moon um, is when the eggs are be being cached, okay? and, the, and the geese are laying one every just a little more than a day. And during that time, you can you can collect like uh, chicken eggs; they'll continue to lay eggs until they got their full clutch. Um, you know, you can't just keep taking eggs for days and days on end, but you can take a few and they'll replenish um, until they have their full clutch. So you're not even making a, making a real impact on them. So we, we got so um, enthusiastic from our learning in that month, in that lunar cycle that we stayed out there, that we continued through the summer to be engaged. And as we did that, we saw a lot of elements from the ceremony that we're in charge of with the beaver bundle that we would not have learned otherwise. This is knowledge that has been lost among the humans, knowledge that animals taught, and it's in the bundle, in the dances, and in the songs, but um, it's not recognized by anybody because nobody's engaged with the, with the environment, with the ecology, and watching, and observing. And so I started, um, and, and Adrian started, really focusing on kind of honing a new uh, Blackfoot phenology which is a, a study of the behavior of plants and animals uh, in that lunar cycle. So Western science and biology, there's a study of phenology as well, um, but it's on, a, it's on the solar side, solar calendar, right? The 365-day solar calendar. Um, ours is on the lunar calendar. So in the Blackfoot system, we have seven winter moons, and we have five to six summer moons, depending on the year. Um, you get the sixth one on what would be kind of the leap year, but it's a moon that we call Somitsuki, so um, the, the deceptive moon, and you don't know, it doesn't come in every fourth year like in the, in the Western system. It comes in three years, four years, and sometimes, you know, it'll go three, and then three again, and four, and four again, and so you have to be actually engaged in watching what's happening with the plants and animals to know when the Somitsuki is coming in, because the things that are supposed to happen during what's called uh, Bidaki, some the eagle moon, don't happen. Right? So we start getting really into this system 
And it's actually part of our, another part of our duties and that we've renewed in the Beaver Bundle that wasn't being done. And that, that is the, the Blackfoot calendar system, um, the stick count system. So we have a stick count system in our bundle that's just for the lunar cycles alone. And then we have another stick count system that is for uh, each of the nights in the winter. That uh, one, each, each night is, is gone, we paint a stick and pass it over um, our altar from north to south. And so as the, as the winter grows, passes through, this, this pile of red painted sticks grows in the south like the sun coming closer. Um, this is this is how the Blackfoot calendar system kind of works. This frog, mysterious frog, has to do with that Salmitsi Gitsum. Uh, the frog is the frog moon, Matsika Pesak Gitsum, which is the moon we're in right now, um, is usually the last winter moon, as it is this year. But on years when the Salmitsi Gitsum comes in, it hops over to become the first summer moon. And so in the, in the stick counts, this little bone represents that frog, okay, the frog hops in. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, I'm just skip, this is a winter count, um, is some of what I've been learning through becoming aware. And I, I started um, this concept, Akakios, is becoming that means to be extremely aware of, of what's going on in your ecology, right? all confused and be aware. And so through that phenology study, I, I started working with students at Red Crow College and got them into it, where I was running a three course series year round and had them do the same exercise that Adrian and I had started doing. Spend time, a um, couple of times a week at the very least, out in one place, keep returning to that place and observing everything that's going on. And what happened was the students got so engaged in it just the way Adrian and I did. It would, they, you know, they were seeing a whole different world. By the time it was done, they couldn't drive down the road anymore without seeing all kinds of different plants and animals that to them were just you know, background before. Um, they got so into it that at the end of the first year, they came to me and they said, well, we don't want it to be done. <laughs> we don't want to stop doing this. Isn't there a way we can continue this class? And I said, well, really, um, going three, three whole terms of, of this kind of study is probably the most that a college is going to let us get away with, right? And it, at that, we're pushing things. But what we could do is we could develop another three-course series where we could go through the year. And that could be like a hands-on traditional food series and we can just develop it as we go along. And so uh, the second year of that, we started bringing the students out and uh, the students that had passed through the phenology and started the traditional foods. It was very experimental. It was hunting and trapping and digging roots, <laughs> picking berries, harvesting, all kinds of things. And then, um, of course, trying to prepare those things and um, preserve them. And so what I'm sharing tonight is some of what I've learned through that process that it's probably now been, oh, maybe, maybe four years into that process. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through kind of an annual round with you um, by the moons so you can hear all the moons and see what, what I was doing with my students and with myself during these moons. Um, and I could have included more in here, but I only had photographs of so many different activities. There's a lot of things that we did that I, I never had photographs of. So um, you'll see a, a portion of it, <laughs> just to give you, give you a good taste. So the first uh, moon in the Blackfoot cycle is Idolstoy. And this is when the cold arrives. That's what it means. And this is the first winter moon, and it's the um, the Blackfoot lunar cycles are counted from, you know, the first crescent to the last. Right? So this is this is the moon that starts up uh, in the Western calendar. It will start up during the month of October sometime. We get the first crescent moon, and that's when the thought story uh, begins. So during this moon, of course, um, a 
lot of preparations are being made <laughs> by the beavers and ourselves and lots of animals uh, for the for the cold that's coming. And we see uh, swans come through. That's a that, the swans always come through at the first and last winter moon, you know, to let us know it's it's coming and going. Um, one of the food sources that becomes available uh, in Itautstoi is the um, what I call bullberries. People know them as buffalo berries. And, um, in in Blackfoot, they're they're known as Mixinitsin, uh, red berry, basically. And again, just taking a cue from the animals, when do the animals start feasting on them? Um, that happens during this moon, the adult story. We wait for the cold to actually arrive during this moon before we harvest them uh, because we use a certain technique. And that is, we put a, a tarp, and usually we have a few people working. If you can, it's a really good uh, kind of communal harvest, and you have a really fun time if you have three or four people um, working on it. You're all gossiping and having a good day together, <laughs> um, like you saw in the initial slide for the for the uh, program tonight. But you know, sometimes you got to work it alone. So this is Adrian with her tarp laid out under a branch, and you hold the the end of the branch, and you use a little um, a teepee button basically like a, a little uh, Saskatoon switch. And you just tap the branch and you don't beat on it, wail on it, just, just tap it. And if those berries are ready, they fall. Okay? If we've had a good cold, the berries will be ready and they fall. And you can harvest buckets of these um, in a couple of hours really easy. Loads and loads of them uh, with, with uh, minimal damage to yourself. Like if you're trying to pick them, you're going to be good thorns all over the place. <laughs> You'll still get stuck a little bit even doing it this way, but uh, the bush gets it back because you, you can get it a little bit as well. So um, this is a, <clears throat> we, one of my students actually um, developed a better method for the solo collection. And um, I didn't get a picture of her doing it, but I, that's how I harvested my berries this year. And that is <laughs> to take a new technology, the umbrella, and hook it over the branch <laughs> and do the tapping. Okay? <laughs> and it works really well if you, if you have to be solo. But again, if it's better if you can get grouped together. It's more fun to gossip and all. Um, so that's one of the ones we harvest for adult story, one of the main ones. Um, there's some other there's some other kind of plants that we do a little bit with the adult story too, but I don't have any pictures of them. The next moon is And this is when the rivers freeze all the way over. That's what it means. And the rivers freeze all the way over. And as we get into winter, of course there's gonna be less plant <laughs> related food stuff, so you, you'll have to bear with me through a few animals. Um, but until we start getting toward the end of winter and back to the plant stuff. But I just wanted to show you a whole annual round um, for cohesiveness. So this is, as the rivers are freezing over, of course all the birds are migrating, getting the heck out of here because uh, their access to food stuff is, is going away. Uh, but we do get some new species, some winter species in, like this golden eye, who can uh, get by on just the small river crags, fishing the small river crags. So he's there through the winter. Um, one of the things that I did with my students during this moon is we do hunting of deer. And that the, the, um, the deer mating is would be pretty much over by then. Um, so we would hunt deer, we'd butcher deer, and we go through the, the preservation and preparation of, of all of the deer. And uh, we also, we save these hides, and um, toward the end of winter, uh, we did a class on, on brain tan hides. Right? And that was a real popular class at the college too. And it's a lot harder to brain tan a hide <laughs> than one would think by reading the process in a book. 
it's a week long for for two people working on a hive. It's a good week long effort, long days, hard muscle work, um, not easy to do. So there is still some plant stuff we can do even as things get cold. And one of them that I do with the students is uh, I show them this plant. This is of course um, dogbane, and um, in Blackfoot it's called inuksap, it's the little rope, and it's called that for a reason. There's two, two plants in Blackfoot territory that make really good cordage, make really good uh, hemp rope, and this is one of them. So <clears throat> during this, this lunar cycle I'll take my students out and we'll collect the, the dry uh, dogbane stems and practice making um, ropes with them, little uh, ropes that we will then use as rabbit snares <laughs> in the moon to come. Um, so that's one of the things. This is more dog bane stems. Basically, you, you crush the stem and then uh, take the, crush the stem, open it up, and then you take out the, uh, the inner, I don't know what you call that, the, the inner wall of the, of the plant, you leave the, the outer two layers of the bark, but that inner one that's really wooden tough, you take that out and you're left with just the fiber and then you can spin and twist the fiber into cordage. And it makes a really strong cordage. So the next moon into the winter, third one, the Samikokomiakos, the long night's moon. And this is when we get the, um, the winter uh, solstice. So this is going to be the, the Christmas moon. And it's called long nights because we get the long nights, right? The, the longest nights of the year. So, like I said, this is when um, we would make use of our, of our dog bait uh, hemp ropes. We do rabbit snaring. And in Blackfoot, there's uh, Blackfoot territory, there's three different rabbit species. Um, only one of them are we allowed to eat, and that's, that's this one. There's taboos against eating the others. Um, and this is what they call a black rabbit, Sagatsista, the mountain cocktail, which I'm sure you're all familiar with from your gardens. Another kind of um, delicacy, a Blackfoot delicacy during the middle of winter is a porcupine. Um, people would talk in the past, there's elders on record talking about how during the middle of winter uh, they would include just a little bit of porcupine meat in their diet. Okay? And I don't know if it was because of the fattiness of it, um, because it is very fatty, but, but it seemed to be like a delicacy meat uh, added just during the winter. Um, so, I started including that, and um, we would do one or two porcupines. One that we should be doing, but we're not yet, if we were to watch what the other animals are eating during the winter and learn from the animals like we're supposed to be doing, um, we would be going after geese during the snow. This is, of course, bald eagle <laughs> with his buddy the magpie. Um, He's taken out a goose, and I wish I wish I could have shot the full scene. I do have a little bit of video of it, but off, out of view here, there's a coyote sitting, waiting, <laughs> and it really shows the, the the kind of the hierarchy uh, with them. The coyote is not going to mess with that uh, eagle, not a chance. And uh, surprisingly enough, the 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 magpies have kind of a treaty with the coyote, right? So the magpies were also, a lot of them were just sitting right around the coyote if he wasn't harming them. They're all waiting for a piece of the goose. Um, but yeah, I would like to, if it was only legal, <laughs> include geese in that, that part of the winter. Now this moon, the, the fourth one in winter, is called Gattoi, and this refers to needing help to eat. And the reason for this is because at this point, in the past, people's um, their preserved foods, like a lot of their plant foods especially, uh, would run out. So you have to rely on, um, on a lot of help 
from your extended family. If you run out of food, everybody's got to kind of rely on each other with what's left um, to get through the winter. So in Gantoi, uh, it was known as a, as a kind of a starvation time, the real hardship point of, of the winter. Um, this is just some, uh, uh, what do they call red poles, working on some sunflowers. I try incorporating sunflower, these wild sunflowers into the diet. And they're pretty tough to get much out of. Um, but I think I included these as, as images of uh, food reserves, even among the animals, kind of running short. These are, this is a raccoon den. Um, with a, he's got a little bit of bullberries left there, but not too much to go off of. Then we start into the season of new life. Uh, the fifth winter moon, Bidaki, some the eagle moon. And it's, it's called the eagle moon because this is when the eagles uh, mate and nest. And this is also when the owls mate and nest. The eagles and the owls go very early. Um, this, even this knowledge was kind of lost when we first started taking care of the beaver bundle, we were having people come to, to report to us. We saw an eagle in, um, in December. That's really early, because Bidaki sun doesn't come until February time or so. And uh, we didn't know any better, but now we know, after, after working with the bundle and working with this lunar cycle, that a lot of these moons that are named after animals, the reason that they're named after those animals is because that's the time when those animals are mating. It's like a, the moon is name is like a celebration of the of the new life. So Bidaki Sum is so named because that's when um, they start nesting, the eagles and the owls. And so we watch for that. And that's how we know, especially if uh, we're in a year with the Samitsi Gitsum, with the with the odd moon. Because if the if the eagles and the owls don't start sitting on eggs during the time of that lunar cycle, um, and we think he's beat that case, so then we know, oh, this is the odd year. This is the odd year. This is the, the this is the Sametsuki, some the leap year. Um, so we're not really in beat that case, so. One of the things that I learned from an animal during this <laughs> lunar cycle, I learned it from, from this guy, uh, a little uh, hairy woodpecker is that there's a really nice, tasty, sweet grub <laughs> that's available. <laughs> and that is the poplar borer larva. This guy. I've never even learned this word. I put it on the slide at one point and looked it up at uh, entomo eating, eating the insects, basically, I think is what it's referring to. Um, but yeah, the, the, that uh, hairy woodpecker, I was watching him one day, and I saw him pull something out of there that looks pretty significant. And so I waited till he was gone, and then I went over with my knife and was prying in the, in the same log. And sure enough, I didn't have to dig very far, and I found one of these guys. And I uh, did the fear factor thing, and I ate it. <laughs> it was really sweet. <laughs> If you can imagine what something that was just totally made from, you know, kind of a poplar, uh, uh, you know, wood, sweet, sweet uh, sugar, cotton, cottonwood flavor, yeah, <laughs> came to you. It was, it was good. It was really good. Um, so, but then I thought, you know, I, I tried to figure out how to do it myself, and I can't do it myself. I can't find them myself. I have to look, the only way I've figured out how to find them so far is to look for places where the woodpeckers have recently been digging them and dig in the same area and I seem to find, you know, pockets of them that way. But uh, just going to any log myself and digging in, you know, randomly where I think there might be some, no, it doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> so just something I'm experimenting with. There's no, um, there's, there's no knowledge that I have of Blackfoot traditionally eating insects of any kind, by the way. <laughs> so this is something of my own that I'm doing 
Um, but to me, it makes sense. You know, to me, I wonder about like pre-horse, you know, that kind of wealth, wealthy days that uh, came around the, around with the horse and rifle. Um, most indigenous people of the world do eat insects. Right? So I would be surprised if we went back far in Blackfoot time and didn't find some of that going on. So I'm going to be experimenting with it uh, myself. What you also see during Pitaki Sum is you see, like I was explaining before, when, I, when Adrian and I went early, that moon that we went early was beat that geese so and start watching the geese and you do see them start peering up and start uh, doing their cycle. So you know that that's a food that's getting ready to come. And then we enter Sa'ad so the duck moon, so named because the waterfowl are mating and nesting. Right? We see a return of the ducks, uh, the waters de-ice, and we start getting our first flowers. This is, again, what I would call bullberry, but people have different names for it. Um, Os phlox. And then you start seeing the emergence of uh, these little guys, these kind of wild parsleys and eucinians and these kind of um, plants, which are really good. Um, some of them are really good for both the roots and the greens. Some of them are just really good for the, for the roots. Um, so I wait a little bit. I don't pick these right away. Let them, let them uh, kind of develop a little bit. What I do pick during this um, sa'aki sum are some of the greens that are emerging, like the you know, goosefoot and of course like dandelions and some of, the, some of the things that make good salads, right, are all coming out during this time. Um, Again, like in, in terms of Blackfoot traditions, people will tell you, oh, I don't know about you know greens and stuff. Like nobody was eating salads at the turn of the century, but you know, <laughs> like I, my opinion is that there was a much more diverse diet um, a longer time ago. So I included. Um, eventually, you have the geese nesting, and. Um, that is, of course, they're laying their, laying their clutches, like I said, at the full moon during this lunar cycle. And that is always going to be right after the equinox, the full moon after the equinox, which is Easter. And so for me, I recognize Easter as an, an indigenous holiday of the northern hemisphere. And I, I, I recognize its significance as being one of, um, it's the end of winter starvation. I think this is what made it really important to indigenous people all over the place. This is when you get the first really substantial new food of the season. It's the end of winter starvation. People are going to celebrate that. And Hallmark, by the way, did not make up the Easter Bunny. <laughs> um, this we figured out. The Easter Bunny is uh, the white rabbit, which appears in stories and stuff. And the white rabbit is, you know, always. Uh, associated with time. So what we're talking about is the moon, right? It's that full moon that hides the eggs. So, there's the eggs, which, are, which they're sitting right now. In fact, um, we just had the full moon of uh, Matsi Kapisaki, on the frog moon. And so this week we should start seeing some goslings around in the waters. I haven't seen any yet, but I'm expecting to. I was out Sunday. I didn't see any, but I'm betting sometime this week we'll see them. Let's see Kapisaki, the frog moon. This is the seventh and last winter moon, and it's the seventh. Why is there seven winter moons? In the beaver bundle origin, it's the frog that gave seven winter moons. What happened was every animal was contributing something to the bundle, and uh, there was this tiger salamander that came up. And when when the other animals were contributing to the bundle, they were they were given their robes. Hey, either they were, you know they had nice feathered robes, or they had nice furred robes. And when the tiger salamander gave up, came up to give something, 
you know, he didn't really have a robe. <laughs> and the other animals start picking on him, telling him, what are you even doing here? You don't know, you know, have anything to contribute. Where's, you know, you're naked. <laughs> you shouldn't even be here. But so that he got mad and he sang this song and he stormed out of there. And, um, and then this torrential rain started falling and um, the, the lake started rising and threatened to, to flood out the whole ceremonies. So the animals went to, um, went to that tiger salamander's wife and begged her to go get her husband back and, uh, they, so they could, they could ask his forgiveness. And she did, and so they, they begged him. He sang another song and the rain stopped. And so that, those songs were given to the beaver bundle. Um, and we still know those songs. <coughs> the next animal that came up was the, the frog, chorus frog, Matsi Kapiseki. And ironically enough, that tiger salamander, <laughs> now I'm scared, he's called him, nothing but a face. Um, Namski said, starts teasing the frog. What do you got to give? Right? <laughs> You're just naked. You shouldn't even be here. And he pushed him, and the frog fell down, and he fell down. He fell down on his back like this. He's holding up seven fingers. And he says, what I'm giving to the bundle is seven winter moons. And during those seven winter moons, all you other animals, your fur is, and hide is going to be thick. Your feathers are going to be nice and, and thick. The humans are going to want you for your, <laughs> just for your robes. <laughs> that was its revenge. So that's how we ended up with seven winter moons. So, Matsi Kapisaki, um, asparagus. Now, some people are going to say, but oh, wait a minute, asparagus is not an indigenous plant. <laughs> um, Maybe because of who I am and how I fit into things, I have a little bit of a different perspective on what indigeneity is. Um, when I look at plants out there in the coolies, a lot, of the, a lot of the plants that other people would call invasive species, I know that the only reason that they're being persecuted is because they don't do nice things uh, when it comes to industrial agriculture. They get in the way, right? But in the coolies, they tend to actually, um, after a time, nestle into the ecology, nestle into the system. Like I look at, um, one of the things that I, I like to show my students in the summer is uh, the way that the wormwood, the absinthe, um, fits in. Because that's another introduced species, right? And fairly invasive. Um, but if you, if you look at it, watch what happens with it. Um, when the cottonwood starts seeding out and uh, its seeds are floating around in the air, there's a little spider that goes up on the top of the wormwood and makes a special little nest, a special little, you know, kind of a nesty web thing that looks like cottonwood seeds that landed on the top of the plant. And it, it, look, it fits in um, completely with what the, what the poplars and cottonwoods are doing. So it's a, it's a really cool little, uh, little system that spider has just for that little time of year, and it's only the absinthe uh, that, it, that it uses. And I don't know if that spider came here with the absinthe, but if it did, it figured out how to work with the, with the cottonwoods, right? And if it didn't come with the absinthe and it was here before, then it decided to start using the absinthe instead of whatever it was using before for that system. So it's, a, it's just a, one of the examples that I like to use to show that um, some of these plants that are you know, so-called invasives are fitting in pretty good in get, getting into, you know, getting in the system in ways that we should be trying to get in the system that good, right? We're not working very well with nature. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't uh, have a problem with including um, non-indigenous plants, plants that weren't here uh, on contact, basically, as, uh, as part of the um, round in what I'm calling black for traditional foods. So I go out and harvest these where I can find them along the river, um, the asparagus. And that, 
it, right now actually is a good time to harvest things. We're in that frog boom. And um, just this last weekend, I was out with a, with a, a student and uh, my, my niece at the wetlands where there's a lot of these. But uh, somebody was beating us to it. As we were walking in, I could see in the area where, the, where the, these asparagus are growing, there was this older couple out there, you know, sneakily uh, uh, harvesting them all. And they, had, they hid their, their goods under their jackets as they walked out. <laughs> As if it's like should be a criminal thing to be out there engaging with the world as a human being. But, um, another thing that you can harvest um, that I do this time this time of year is these yellow uh, prairie violets. Now there's there's not a um, well there probably was a Blackfoot name for them, but it's it's a name that's lost. And pretty much the whole top of the plant, flower, greens, and everything we can eat so is completely edible. Um, on the prairie slopes. This is the time of year when I go after the um, the wild parsleys and Eucidians and these kind of things. And I use my modern day uh, digging stick. <laughs> uh, in the past, I can't imagine how tough digging roots was in the past for the women. The, the traditional Blackfoot digging stick is a wooden stick and it's, it's thick, it's good like at least an inch and a half round. Okay? and it tapers off to a point, but it's not like a really sharp point. Um, so I don't know how they, you know, all I can figure is that in the past, they waited until there was a rain, like today would have been a good day to go dig roots, you know. Because um, some of the roots that you, that you, dig, that you dig for, especially um, what we call moss, uh, which is that Indian bread root, it's hard to dig that root uh, in, a, in, in dry soil. So anyway, um, these ones, this one in particular, I like to eat both the greens and the root. Um, there's others that, uh, I think one that's called the Hartleaf Alexander. I don't know the Western names for them so much, but that one's pretty good for just the root. And it's just a starchy root, and I've experimented different things with it. I've experimented kind of, you know, cooking with it, uh, drying it out cutting it into coins and drying it, putting the stuff in uh, soups, a thickener, grating it, all different things I've been trying to, uh, to practice. Uh, this is a lost art among the Blackfoot. Um, there's not really a good root food, uh, starchy root food um, cooking being done by anybody. This is just a selection of different wild parsley's. Ducks are mating. <laughs> oh, because it's a mallard nest, that's why I have it in there. It's mallard nesting time. We had in the previous moon the geese. This is now the time to collect mallard eggs. And there's a whole sequence of different um, waterfowl eggs. Uh, again, you have to know the, the strategies of each one. When we were trying to figure out how to collect eggs, uh, of course, I went around and asked elders, and nobody had done it themselves. They remember their parents doing it, this kind of a thing. The best advice that I got wasn't really good advice. And uh, an elder told me, um, you wait and you watch the ducks. And when you see just the drakes, just the males in the water without the females, then you walk around the perimeter of the water, and you'll find the females on the nests, and uh, you can take the eggs. But if you use that strategy, I mean, it's, it's fairly good strategy to, to know that when the males are alone and the females are sitting on the nests, yeah. But if you walk around the perimeter of the water, you're never going to find a, uh, a duck nest. <laughs> because the mallards, uh, w their strategy is to wait until there's some leafy stuff going on, right? And uh, before they, before they uh, lay their eggs, they want to conceal themselves better. Um, in areas like with butt brush and these kind of things. And, but they put themselves at danger for flooding uh, because of that, that time lag. The geese go very early, so they don't have to worry about the flooding. Um, and they nest on islands and such. But the, but the ducks, starting with the mallards and the blue-winged teals and green-winged teals, um, they all are in flood danger, so they pull their nests back and I found um, mallard and teal nests way up on the coulee slopes. 
um, within, within view of water, but like surprisingly far from the water. Um, so you have to use a different strategy, including a lot of observation if you want to get um, eggs from, from these other species. The first summer moon, most years, like I said, the frog moon can be the first summer moon on, a, on the odd years, but usually the first summer moon is apistishkin satos, um, which means the flower moon. And it's named after uh, the golden bean, the buffalo bean. This was an important flower uh, to Blackfoot people in the past, even though it's, it blooms earlier than this. I don't, know, I don't know if that was the same way in the past. Uh, this plant is known as Otsikin because the flower, when, you, when people looked at it in the past, they thought it looked like a, kind of like a moccasin or a shoe, Otsikin. So some people call it Otsikin Yatosi, like in down south in Browning, um, the Blackfoot Reservation down there is called Otsikin Yatosi. But up here we call it Apistishkit Santos, the flower moon in general. And the reason that this, this flowering was important was because that was the cue um, for buffalo calf hunting. When those, when those started flowering, then people would hunt for buffalo calves. And um, the buffalo calves were um, uh, in high demand for their robes. <laughs> uh, all the little kids wanted buffalo calf robes just like they want like Nike Airs and stuff like that today. If you didn't get your buffalo calf, your new buffalo calf robe every year, you were upset. So that was one of the things. The other thing is these um, flower petals were picked and they were included into the fertilizer mix for tobacco planting. Now I don't know what, what chemical ingredients they contribute to that, but there were, there were just a couple of things that were always standard, um, deer and antelope dung, and um, these flower petals had to be in the fertilizer mix. And then, every, and then everybody had their own kind of additions to that. Everybody had some kind of soil that they included, but it's usually something that they dreamed, a soil that comes from a burrow of a certain um, rodent, they'd go and get that. Um, to mix in their fertilizer. Some would have some other different kind of plant materials that they put in there. But uh, this was a mainstay. This had to be in there. So until you had these flowers, you didn't have tobacco plant. Um, once these flowers were in bloom, then, then you could harvest them and you'd have your, your uh, mix ready for tobacco plant. Um, start getting some of the other flowers coming in. These are the currants, of course. Saskatoons and uh, choke cherries, um, lens potted hoary crest, one of the many mustards that we have that are all edible. Um, Adrian and I harvest some of these every year. I know where you can come get some. Yeah, <laughs> you got you got to punch and weed out some area. <laughs> they do they do grow pretty dense when, when they settle in. Um, the coots start mating during this time, and the coot eggs were, were one of the ones that were most sought after by the Blackfoot. Um, I, I, I think maybe why is just because there's so many of them, and they're very easy to find, because those, if you walk in the cattail reeds in the water, that's where you'll find the, the coot nests. Um, but yeah, I've got recordings from, old, from elders from the turn of the century talking about how coot, coot eggs were taken and uh, emptied into into like um, intestines and and uh, you know tied off and thrown in boiling water to cook as a kind of an egg sausage kind of a thing. Um, this is a coot nest. The second summer moon, itotsu sam sota long rains. So this is start getting into more plant foods. Of course, this is Pisat Sinekim, the prairie onions. Uh, gather lots of onions during this moon. And um, because it's raining, 
It was called the Long Range for a reason, so we wouldn't get our monsoon, um, and, and usually our flooding. Because it's raining, we get different mush mushrooms, funguses. So some of those uh, we work with. This is the, the puff balls, of course, um, which are good, especially especially uh, fresh. We've tried drying them out, and we lose about half of them when we try to dry them. They turn, uh, they turn to spore. But fresh. Um, the best one is the fairy ring mushroom. Fairy ring mushrooms are, you know, prolific, and for a mushroom, they're about as tasty as they come uh, here, and uh, you, can, you can get lots of them. They dry very well, and they rehydrate great, so it's a, it's a really good one to harvest. Some of the other plant foods, this is uh, ground plum, and uh, in Blackfoot, they're called beset, uh Snake food. I don't know why the name, but uh, I love them. They taste kind of like uh, kind of like bell peppers. Kind of a bell pepperish taste. Um, our first berry comes around the uh, the currants. So we gather lots of golden currants, black currants, red currants. And then we enter into the next moon, third, third summer moon, Okamukis Totsutsitsubi, when the Saskatoon berries ripen. And the Saskatoons, of course, were the mainstay berry of the Blackfoot world uh, because they preserve very well, they sun dry very well, and uh, there's lots of them, they're very nutritious. And so these were provoked a major celebration. Um, what we call uh, akokats and the Sundance. The Sundance is actually a berry picking camp. Um, so whenever you, wherever you're gonna find those Sundance camps is near the most famous berry areas. <laughs> like right now in, uh, on the Blood Reserve, the Sundance camp is just below the Belly Buttes. And some people think it's because of the Buttes that it's positioned there. It's because right down below the buttes along the Belly River is this area where there's tons and tons of Saskatoon berries. And um, like you never believe, eh? like I, I can't find anywhere like that, anywhere around Lethbridge with, that, with those kind of berries. Um, so that's where the Hutterites get all their berries, by the way. <laughs> there's lots down there. Um, so yeah, it's a berry picking camp with ceremonies in the evening. You go, and you go and pick in the morning, and then you kind of relax in the afternoon, kids take a swim, and in the evening there's ceremony. And it's a, it's a couple of weeks camp um, to harvest berries. Other berries that are still available during that time, you have the, uh, the currants still. The honeysuckle, of course, you don't want to eat. We got honeysuckle. Um, that's you know escaped into the coolies and such like that. Again, it's fitting in. I see I see the um, the cedar waxwings love in the honeysuckle, right? But humans, no, you don't want to eat them. Um, skunk brush sumac. I liken them to uh, sour patch kids candy. <laughs> <laughs> strong, strong citrus. Um, citric acid, but it's good stuff. But if you pick it though, your hands get, you know, really encrusted with that, uh, with that citric acid. And you lick your fingers and make sour faces for the next 10, 15 minutes afterward. Uh, this is also when I start working with the bread root. Um, what we call moths, which just means root. So this was the prototypical root in Blackfoot. Uh, this is the main starchy food root peoples and this is what it looks like basically like a I don't know if you call it potato which some people call them um, uh, what is it Indian um, oh shoot forgetting that forgetting that the, the vegetable that some people compare it to but it never made sense to me um, but it's got this if you don't know this plant it's got this uh, 
the skin on it, it comes off really easy, and then you've got just beautiful uh, white um, starchy root, and it tastes good just raw, and it tastes good cooked, and it dries really well. Um, I usually dry mine in coins, but you can also, if you want to use it as thickeners and soups and stuff like that, like one of the ways that I do know roots, uh, these starchy roots were used in blackfoot cooking is in the berry soup as an addition to the berry soup to thicken it up. And so um, if you grate it, you can add it to the berry soup and thicken it up really nicely. Some of the mints we're picking this time of year. Uh, so this is bergamot. Of course, this is like, this is strong mint. This is like uh, Buckley's. And that's pretty much what we use it for. Okay? Dry it, dry it, save the leaves. And um, when, you get, when you're getting sick, uh, when you're getting a cold, this is great stuff to make tea with. Uh, but it's not the kind of tea you want to drink just as a nice, nice evening beverage. Right? <laughs> we have other mints here for that that I didn't bring pictures of. Uh, they call this one the Monica P in Blackfoot. It means the bachelor because he's so showy. Okay? <laughs> um, going into the fourth and next to last summer moon, uh, when the choke cherries ripen. Choke cherries were also a very important Blackfoot berry. Um, lots and lots of choke cherries harvest because they're easy to harvest and also. Uh, they can be crushed and dried in cakes. Uh, that was the way it used to be. And then you rehydrate it. And there's a mix. Um, Buxinisamon is called it. And um, <coughs> the crushed choke cherries. And you just eat it. And you don't, you don't chew it because it's got flakes of the, uh, the, the root, the, the seeds and everything are pounded um, when you crush them, right? All pounded into it. You don't separate the seeds. They're all in there in the pits. So you just swallow them, hey? Um, but there's a couple of things that are going around in like the discourse of the community about the benefits, the, the fringe benefits of, um, of Buxinisamon. Uh, one is that the plant has a lot of cyanic acid in it, and so it might serve as a kind of a low, really, really low level kind of a chemo um, to, to stop uh, cancers from building. The other thing that people talk about is you know, having those those pits clean you out. You get, you get some of that in your system. Um, so those were eaten year round. They were because they could be preserved so easily. This is, this time of year, we're also getting our tobacco uh, to its to its full growth. So um, we have actually two different tobacco plants that are blackfoot tobaccos. And these were the only plants that were ever guarded. Well, I shouldn't say that because one of the tobacco planting kits that Adrian and I have, that's an old kit that, that uh, um, was given to us, has bags of seeds for both of our tobacco species, plus what I think are seeds of what we call sawgossin, which is a yellow angelica that grows in the mountains. Right? Um, but because those seeds were in a, in, a, in a planting kit, somebody, whoever owned that planting kit before, was growing, I think, sawgrass. That's what I, I believe those seeds are. I haven't been able to get any of those old seeds that I think are sawgrass to grow. Um, but the tobacco we do grow. We grow two different species, and there's a whole story behind how we ended up with two different species. One came out of dreams um, that these four brothers had. Another came from the sun when the four brothers wouldn't share. Somebody went on vision questing um, to get tobacco seeds. So we have a larger plant and a smaller plant. This is the larger plant, and I don't know the actual Western species name for it. Um, this is what the smaller plant's flowers look like. These are our two tobaccos. This is uh, Yampa, what they call Yampa. In Blackfoot, we call it Nisikapas because it um, grows double roots. Nisikapas means double root. <laughs> so during this, during this moon, um, 
we start picking these these tick up outs. This is the wild carrot. And I think if somebody could market this, it'd be like the next macadamia nut. These are so tasty. They're kind of like half between like half carrot, half hazelnut. You got a hazelnut kind of consistency with a carrotish taste. It's really good stuff. This is my students out on the blood reserve doing uh, these tick up outs harvest. Um, some plants that are not food plants we harvest this time of year too. I, know I didn't talk about sweetgrass, which is one that a lot of people harvest earlier in the summer. This is one that Adrian and I harvest um, later in the summer. This is fern leaf desert parsley. And uh, we use the root of this plant for our winter smudge. We use sweetgrass during the summer moons, and during the winter moons we use this plant. There's a, there's a story that goes along with this um, about a woman who married a star. And I've, I've made sure to include this plant in today's presentation because this plant is often misidentified. Um, the Blackfoot name for this plant is Omach Gats, and this is a sacred plant. Um, it comes from the sky world, uh, the woman that married this star, and she was told not to dig it up. She dug it up and could see back down to the earth and got homesick, and so had to go back down. But uh, she brought this plant back down with her. And in somebody's ethnobotany, <laughs> um, I think it might have been John Helson who started it. The eth John Helson's ethnobotany, perhaps. Uh, he identified Omachgas as arrow leaf balsam. And so that same plant was. Um, represented that way in Alex Johnson's book of Black, Blackfoot Plants and uh, elsewhere. In fact, everywhere that I see this, uh, uh, somebody identifying Omach Gats, they identify it as Arrowleaf Balsam Root. But in Arrowleaf Balsam Root, in real Blackfoot tradition, we call that Bonogatki, the elk, elk uh, woman. And it has a totally different story to it, but that was a food root not a ceremonial uh, route. And even in, even in the Galt Museum, you go in, in the, there's an area with some Blackfoot plants. In there, it's misidentified. This is Omach Gats. This is the real um, route that we use with our sponge that comes from that story. It's the, it's the uh, fern leaf desert parsley. This is what the root looks like. And we grate it up into a powder it up into powder, we use one of these roots per winter moon. So just one of the corrections that I want to make to, to some, of the, some of the things that I see mistaken out there in Blackfoot ethnobotanies. But another one that's really bad is the recommendation to use a hellbore root for a soothing infant's gums when they're teething. can't imagine who came up with that one, but it's a really bad recommendation. I've seen it in print several times. Um, gumweed, oxpe, a really good uh, cough remedy for if you have a if you have a, a persistent or deep cough. Um, I always harvest some of this to use when we get colds and stuff like that. You just cut it up, cut it up into little pieces, stems, flowers, and everything. Dry it, and then make a tea with it. And it, and it works really well. Um, wild tarragon, I collect during this moon. Uh, more prairie onions, still available. And then we get to the last summer moon, end of the Blackfoot year. Awakasi uh, Gisum, the deer moon, so named because the deer are in rut. Walking around looking like fools. <laughs> um, one of the plants that is still being harvested by a lot of people today, uh, we call Amach uh, uh, the red tea in Blackfoot. Amach this is Tixi. Um, and uh, this plant, it's used as a, as a kind of a tonic, a, a healing tonic tea if you're just feeling bad <laughs> not feeling not feeling good um, you don't have to necessarily be really sick or anything like that although people who are really sick drink lots of it too 
Uh, we take the whole plant, you know, cut off um, above the ground, but we used to cut the stems, the flowers, and everything up just the same way as with the with the uh, gum weed. Dry it up and um, use it as a tea. Um, with stutzimon, the ball cap this berry comes into into fruit this time of year, and these are really really good. I don't know if you've had them, but they're, really, they're very they're like, kind of like grapes. Little seedy, but uh, they're, they're nice seeds. They're small little, almost like, um, reminds me of uh, fish eggs. <laughs> Still a lot of um, choke cherries available this time of year, and you might get a good freeze come in and be able to already start picking bullberries some years. And then we go back into winter. So that's an annual round, some of it. There's a lot of things, like I said, that I didn't take pictures of. Um, a lot of other things that, we, that I've been collecting and I've shown students. Um, but those are some of the ones that persistently I'm using. And the, the experiment is continuing. It's very early yet. So that's my presentation. I know I took a little bit over the hour, but if there's any questions, and they keep, keep pulling those roots. Don't they run out? Don't they plant them? Nobody's... Blackfoot are not traditionally gardeners. Yeah. Um, you you know, uh, talk about they pull those roots. Oh, yeah. And they, they do that all the time. Do they plant new ones? No. Uh, but, but what I've noticed, like, like say, like the Yampa, for instance, is one that's um, supposed to be very vulnerable. To planting, we won't harvest clean. Hey, won't harvest an area clean, and we won't use that area for another couple of years. You got to just move around. Same thing with um, with uh, the uh, yellow bells. Yellow bells are very vulnerable to over harvesting, so you don't you know harvest a whole lot from one area, and you and you move. Hey? Um, the problem is, of course, like if a lot of people were doing this then you might have different people visiting the area. And, and, uh, but yeah, traditionally Blackfoot are not har a harvester, or not uh, planters, but these plants were all, all harvested in the past, right, in, in large numbers. Um, some plants respond very well to being harvested. Like that area that I'm talking about with all of the berries, I think the reason that that area has so many berries and a lot of other things is because it, it's harvested and they, they respond well and they produce more. Some don't, hey? so yeah. But no, we haven't been we haven't been replanting anything. But the but I I know every place that I've been harvesting from has not re reduced the population. I've been watching year after year, and most of the places actually have a lot more. Yeah. This was really interesting. I'm curious. Uh, everyone is saying this is in early spring, so by the No. <laughs> by, by what? By the by the phenology of actually watching what's happening. No, everything's on track. And, and they're all still in the same synchronization. Yeah. So it's just our Western calendar that thinks it's early. Yeah. yeah. Everything's on track. I have another question for you. Yes. How do you translate your language in French? <laughs> if I knew French, <laughs> I wish I knew French. <laughs> It'd be a good skill here in Canada. Um, I just wondered, from reading other books uh, from other places, <coughs> cattails were a great source of food, and so were blue camels. Yeah, yeah. The, I know blue camels don't grow just here, but they do grow near Walton. Uh -huh. So, are those in your mind? Yep, definitely. Um, in fact, cattail, one of the things that I do that I didn't include here is, is as we go into Sa'aki, so the duck moon, uh, what I notice is that the first food that the beavers are eating in, in wetland areas are the cattail roots. Eh? They're harvesting those and eating those. And so I'll wade through, and the beavers will only eat a piece of it and then toss the rest. So I'll take the tossed up. They already, har they already pick them for me. 
I just take what's what's left over and um, take those home and use them. It's another good starch route, but yeah, cattail goes through a whole sequence of, of different uses where you can use the stems, you can use the flowers, you can use the pollen, um, all different kinds of food uses for cattail, and I try to make use of it for sure. Um, the camas, there is, like you said, there's patches in the foothills um, down by Waterton and uh, across into Montana, there's even more of them. And Blackfoot does have a Camish tradition. Um, I forget the name. I think it's called Mrs. Sun. It's basically called like excrement. But it's because of it when it's cooked, it has that kind of look and consistency. But it's very sweet, right? It tastes good. So kids used to love it as a kind of almost like a candy. Um, and so a lot of it was, what, that was one thing that was traded across the mountains a lot. Um, when Blackfoot would trade with, uh, with Salish and Kootenai peoples, um, we would trade bison, and they would, they would give that to <laughs> Sisa. Any other questions? Yeah, they're, they're fed to people at the ceremonies. Basically, the ceremony is like a, a feast of the end of winter, you know, that, that one. There's a, the beaver bundle has major public ceremonies at the end of winter and at the, at the end of summer. Um, it's the end of winter one where you have, you have the feast of eggs. It's kind of like the eat the black feast almost, you know. Um, you have the feast of eggs. And there's a, the song that goes with the eggs tells that the eggs bring people long life. So um, the, the traditional method of, of preparing eggs in Blackfoot was to boil them. Um, that's a, boiled either whole or boiled in gut. Okay? Um, it's a kind of an egg sausage. Kind of thing. But yeah, they're, at the ceremony, they were always fed boiled whole. Because um, there's a part of the ceremony where you, you make a kind of a nest. Um, and you have, have one egg in there, and you use the crow, because it was the crow that taught Blackfoot people how to find the eggs. And there's a, the song that son goes with the crow, and he flies down and cracks the first egg that's eaten in the ceremony. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's not, there's no, it's not a big secret. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's eat. It's, it's fun. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you 